if you want to turn to, to Matthew chapter 8, that's where we're going to be uh, ministering today. And um, so as you know, we've been doing this series on the gospel in Matthew, and there's just a lot there. It's, we're going through it. and we're, I, I want us to digest really what, what Matthew is sharing in regards to his master, his, his Lord, his, his, his friend, Jesus. And, and to discover Jesus as Matthew saw him, and especially Matthew saw Jesus as the king. And the king come to planet Earth, and that his kingdom is, is an expression of who he is and everywhere that he goes. So we've been looking at uh, the kingdom and, and Jesus, his, his ministry, his life, his teaching. And today we're, we're coming to, to Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at at doing the stuff. And um, my goal, actually for all of ministry, is twofold, and I expressed this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to express it again. Is, but it's that we would, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we would model Jesus authentically. Um, disciples are meant to, to mimic, to mirror the, their rabbi, the, the teacher, and, 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 but how much more so are Christians to, to mirror and to model the life of Jesus. And so the most important thing in, in all of life is to come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that relationship, as it matures, it ought to grow in, in, in depth and love and, and the, the passion that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as we, we grow in Christ, there, there needs to be this, this coming reconciliation with our Heavenly Father, you know, that, that, that we, would, we would come to, to, to see our Heavenly Father through the eyes of Jesus. But from this relationship, vertical relationship, us to God, that there would be the, this overflow. And, and that overflow is also meant to be relationally. But, but we, we begin to um, interact with people in the way that Jesus would interact with them. We minister to people the way that Jesus did. That's, that's doing the stuff. It's, it's, it's doing what Jesus did. It's, it's called being a disciple, a, a Christian. That the doing the stuff is a, um, a quote. I, I'm reading a book uh, um, on John Wimber. It was written by his wife, Carol, um, not too long after his death in, in 97, so he's been gone a while. But um, I've always loved Wimber. I, I, I love his, his boldness, his courage. And, but he had, if you, he had this story, and he, he liked this phrase, doing this stuff. But he, uh, in 1963, just, just briefly um, give a context for what I'm, I'm using as an illustration this morning. But 1963, he was in the, the band, the Righteous Brothers. He was their keyboardist. He introduced the two of them together. Um, and uh, he was the music arranger. He was their manager. I mean, and they were beginning to top the charts. He, he was, you know, everything he'd ever dreamed of and, and worked hard for was, was coming to a reality. But his life was falling apart. His marriage was falling apart. He had four kids. They were separated. They were on their way to a divorce. In the middle of the night, God appears to both of them hundreds of miles apart, um, and both of them make this commitment to, I want to know the God of, of the universe. And they become Christians together and are reconciled. They begin, they don't know, John especially had no background whatsoever. He, he, he knew nothing about the Bible. He was embarrassed about it. He felt very inadequate that five-year-olds knew more about <laughs> Jesus than he did. But he began to devour the Word and, and really... Um, was coming alive to him, and, and he, he was loving what he was reading about, about Jesus. And uh, at some point early on in his, his, his faith, um, he, he was at church, and he walked up to one of the elders, and he, says, he asked him the question, and he said, when do we get to do the stuff? And uh, the elder's response was, well, what do you mean, the, the stuff? And he says, well, you know, the healing the, the sick and seeing the eyes of the blind open and, and multiplying the fishes and the loaves. When do we get to do the stuff? And the, uh, <laughs> the 
the elders' response was, oh, well, we don't do the stuff anymore. I said, oh, we believe in the stuff. You know, we believe that Jesus did the miracles. We believe that he still can. Uh, we just don't do the stuff anymore. We don't do the miracles anymore. That's, we don't need to. Well, there's a, this great disconnect I, I find in Christianity is that somehow along the way, we began to make peace with this, this distinction between uh, teaching the stuff and doing the stuff. And somewhere along the line, we, we began to say, teaching is enough. And, and I want to suggest to you that uh, they're really, they cannot be separated. They're, they're too integrally entwined with one another. Jesus' teaching was always meant to be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, with Jesus, there, there's just never a distinction between teaching this stuff and doing it. It's, it's um, the, the people, the common people, as they looked at Jesus, um, what they saw was someone that they were amazed at that he was, he was teaching and with authority. You know, the Pharisees, um, they taught with a lot of authority, but it, it wasn't authority to actually change situations and lives and set people free. Uh, but Jesus comes in his teaching, the kingdom happens. I mean, people are set free, people are healed. There, there's such a, um, a wonder of, of seeing king, the kingdom of God realized on planet Earth. That there, there's no separation. I don't think there was ever meant to be a separation. So as we draw into to Matthew chapter 8, we've just concluded three chapters of Jesus' teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, longest uh, continuous period of, of you know, of, of Jesus' teaching in all of the Gospels, all the four Gospels. But immediately, the first thing that Matthew does in coming back is he wants to show Jesus doing the stuff. He wants to show him his, 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 his he, he's not just teaching. And, and Matthew is very precise on this. He keeps going from teaching to showing, teaching to showing. He, 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 I think intentionally, so as I begin to, to take a look at it, he's very uh, careful in how he is presenting Jesus because he wants to see Jesus as not just a teacher, but a doer as well. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8, and I want to read verses 1 to 4 to start. It says, when, when he came down from the mountain, the Mount of Olives, not Mount of Olives, but the Mount of um, uh, Sermon on the Mount, whatever mountain that was. Great crowds followed him. And it says, Behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now, leprosy um, was an incurable disease. Um, I don't think that we understand today the, the terror that came with that. Um, when you were diagnosed, you've got leprosy. Just the... The, the, the horror of that moment. I mean, it was, it was the, the most feared disease in the ancient world, and, and rightly so, because it was an, a slow, awesome, I mean, uh, awful, gruesome, painful death. I mean, the nerves and the endings of, would, would just begin to die so that you no longer feel. And if you can't feel, you can't protect. And, and so you, the injuries would just amount, and your fingers would, you know, and you just begin to, to die from the outside in, piece by piece by piece. And, and it was just, it was an awful. But the lepers, they were these untouchables. And they were walled off from society. And part of that was from fear. We understand that, you know. I, um, today we're, the COVID, I mean, <laughs> it's a very fearful thing to, and so we, we we're not, some, some are, of us are much more, you know, we're very, like, this, very fearful of this. And, and, but leprosy was, was so much more. Now, but the other aspect of this walling off was, was the law. 
If you turn to Le- Leviticus chapter 13, I want to read just two verses. It's kind of Moses' instruction in the law for how to deal with, with leprosy. So beginning in verse 45 of Le- Leviticus 13, it says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now, I want you to just begin to envision what's what this would mean to a person. You are unclean. That means you are, well, you're spiritually, at that point in time, you're, you're considered, you know, you know, that uncleanness is, has a spiritual con- connotation. They shall live alone. You're isolated. You're, you're, his dwelling place shall be outside. I mean, so you're just cut off from family, friends, community. But, but just as, as awful, maybe worse, is if you're a person of faith, especially you're cut off from God. You're cut off from the temple. And that was the expression of coming into the presence of God. You can't go there unclean. And you can't go there as a, as a leper. You're, you're forever separated from community of faith, Family, friends, everything, unclean, you're, you're cut off. Well, so in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2 then, we, we see that this leper who is, who has been living probably for years, cut off, disconnected. And, and he approaches Jesus. I mean, he, and he's, he's a desperate man, you know, and, and he covers his mouth. You know, it's the, the, the ancient world's mask. You cover that upper lip. Unclean, unclean. And as he approaches, you know, his clothing and everything you're supposed to wear, <laughs> you can't even wear nice clothes. You've got to wear ripped clothes. And, 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 but he's coming, and you can see the crowds around the leper just <laughs> scattering as far away from this, this person as, as possible. And he's watching Jesus uh, as he's approaching, I think. And he's, are you going to reject me? Because if you do, I have to turn around. But Jesus lets him approach. And it says that he falls at his feet, at Jesus' feet. And, and the word there that knelt before him is proskuneo. It's usually translated in the Greek as worship. And he's prostrate before the Lord. And, and, he, and he's just, and he, 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 he says, if you are willing you can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. And, and Jesus, it says, that he reached out and he touched the man. Now, this was, this was forbidden by the law. You're, you're not to touch the unclean because when you touch the unclean, you become unclean. Um, Jesus touches them maybe the first time in, in years that someone else has touched this man. Um, and, and Jesus, in love, and he says, I will. I will. I desire. I want this to be so. I, I desire it to be so. The man is healed. And, and I'm just left to this. Jesus, it's interesting that he he was not afraid to touch the untouchable. Even though it was against law, it was socially unacceptable, in love. But what did love require in that moment? It was required that Jesus touch him. And that's the very first thing he does. And then he expresses his heart and he says, I will be healed. I, I desire that to be so. There's this question that humanity struggles with. And does God care? Does God care in, in my, my place of uh, suffering and pain and affliction and, and illness and sickness, all the things? Does Jesus, does he care? Does he see that I'm broken and in pain? Does he, does, does he will? That, that's the, really the question. Does he will? And there are books 
lots of them written on this subject. Um, theologians try to tell us the reason why God cares. Um, apologists try to explain to a world that, that God isn't distant, that he's, he's not uncaring, that, that he loves us. But, but I, I think that's all well and good, but much of that misses the point. The, the key is Jesus himself. Is how does Jesus speak to this situation? Does God care? And in Jesus, we, we, we get our answer. We, we find that answer. He himself answers the question. I, I challenge you to, to read the Gospels with an eye to how Jesus is ministered, especially healing. And what I'll challenge you, but you will not find a record of any place in all of Scripture that someone comes to Jesus and is not healed. There's not it, hundreds and hundreds. I mean, just in Matthew alone, I'll, I'll, I'll point that out in just a little bit, but, but there are just verse after verse after verse after verse. He healed all the sick, all the sick, all that came to him, all the diseased, all the, again and again and again and again. And you, you begin to realize that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that were coming to him, thousands. And, and, and he, there's no record of him never healing, not healing someone that, that came to him. And each time as he's healing him, he says, I desire, I will, I desire, I will. I mean, he, he's speaking the heart of God again and again and again and again. John, at the end of his gospel, that last verse just, just says, you, you would not believe all the things that Jesus did, that I watched Jesus do. And I could not even, if I had access to all the books in all the world, I, I couldn't, they wouldn't be enough for me to describe all the things that I've seen. But it's that again and again, I will be clean. I will be clean. This is a, such a critical um, understanding of who God is for us to grasp. I, I, I can't emphasize this enough, how, how important. You, you will not minister beyond your understanding your belief that it is the will of God that people be made whole. It, it, to, the, to the extent that you question that, that will be the extent to which you're able to effectively minister to people. And all around us, we, we see broken people. And, and so many of them are these untouchables. They're alone, they're isolated, they're cut off from family, they're cut off from faith, they're, 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 they're struggling. Uh, they feel like they're cut off from God, that somehow that they're, they're unclean. And, and these people, they need someone, Jesus, to touch them and, and to say, I will, God wills. Jesus wills that you, you be made whole, no matter what that, that, that brokenness is. This isn't a, uh, something you, you, I think you, you settle once, and then it's forever settled. I don't know about you, but I, I, again and again and again, I have to resettle this. I have to again revisit scriptures. And I've, I put a list here, but I, I will regularly just go through and I'll, I'll read the scriptures where it just says, he healed all, he healed all. He healed. And I, I have to revisit that because I have to re see again from afresh the heart of, of God, to, to see that he cares about the broken, no matter what that brokenness is. He does not abandon people to their brokenness in, in this life. He does not. He does, that's not his heart. He does not want to do that. So we continue in, in Matthew chapter 8, in, in verse 5 through 13. It says in verse 5, When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him. Now I want you to stop right there, and, and I want you to... Matthew is, again, he, he's very... Um, there's a lot of healings that he witnessed. He, he could have chosen a lot, but, but he, he's dealing with the untouchables. That's what he wants to show, is that 
when, when Jesus heals all, he, he means all. <laughs> even the untouchables, even the ones that you would, you would think would be somehow beyond the grace of God. Um, so a Roman centurion comes up to him. And, and a Roman, and especially a centurion, is hated. This is the enemy. This, the, these are the oppressors, the ones that have come in and taken our freedom from us. And the, and the ones that, that force us to bow to their will, the will of Rome. Uh, he's a Gentile. He's uncircumcised. He's unclean. I mean, and Scripture forbids that, that faithful Jews would, would come into the presence of an uncircumcised Gentile. You know, you know who the first person in all of uh, New Testament recording that uh, came under the roof of a, a Gentile? Do, do you remember? It was, it was Peter in Acts chapter 10. And Cornelius, and, and Peter has quite a battle actually to, to go there. I mean, the Lord has to convincingly show Peter that this is, is his will. And it, as Peter approaches Cornelius' home and he and he comes to the door and he meets Cornelius, his family that's there and friends that have gathered to, to, to hear what Peter has to share. In verse 28 of Acts chapter 10, um, Peter tells Cornelius and his, his family, you yourselves know, he, he says, you, you know, <laughs> Gentiles, you know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, another gen, a, a Gentile, that word, but God has shown me that, that I should not call any person common or unclean. He says, you know that it's against the law for me to be here. But God has shown me that, that uh, I'm no longer to regard you as, as cut off and unclean. And he enters the, the house of Cornelius and he preaches the gospel of Jesus to him and, and the whole household is saved. Did you know that Jesus was on his way to go into the home of a Roman centurion? He said, I will come and I, I will heal him. Jesus would have gone right into that man's home. He would have kill, uh, healed that, that, that servant. And, uh, but this, this, this Roman centurion has an amazing faith. Um, he, he tells Jesus, I'm, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. I'm not worthy of that. He said, you just give the word and my servant will be made well. He says, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of under authority. I'm under authority and I'm in authority and I understand how authority works. And I recognize that you are a man with authority. You give the word and it's going to be so. And Jesus says, you know, I've, I've not found faith like this in, in all of Israel. This is an, an astounding faith that, you, that you've... And so Jesus gives the word and that, that servant was healed in that, in that moment. But I want you to begin to see that Jesus has a heart for the untouchables. The ones that that you're not supposed to, to minister to. That, that, that's almost like beyond the reach of God. Now, I have a couple of pictures of, of um, the temple that just to kind of I, to illustrate a little bit what, what Gentiles are up against. But So this is the Temple Mount, what it would have um, looked like at the time of Herod. And you can see that large, flat area. Now, the, the temple in the, the, the middle there um, the temple proper is about it's roughly about four football field size. This is, this is big. It, it's not a it's not as small. As, but that court of the Gentiles outside is, is huge. But that's as far as the Gentiles can come into the, the temple. And if you take a look at the the next um, slide, you can see that um, there's the women's court. That's as far as women could go. They could go no further. And then you have into where, where men could go and then, then only where priests could go. There's wall after wall after wall after wall. And, and, but as a Gentile, you are about as far out 
from the presence of God. You know, you're, you're, you're walled off by, there's like three or four gates that you'd have to go to to actually get into the Holy of Holies, wall after wall after wall. And so this Gentile is an outsider. He's considered this untouchable, this unclean. And yet Jesus is, is declaring, I, I make no distinction. I, I, I'm going to minister to the unclean. Now, I want us to begin to see through the eyes of Jesus and ask the question, who are the, the untouchables around us? Because that's likely who Jesus is wanting to, to reach through us, that he's wanting to touch and to love them, to, to show them that they are not outside of God's favor, outside of God's grace and God's love for, for, their, for them. I, uh, one more thought, I'll just share this in, in passing, but this, this centurion, I don't think he probably knew a great lot about um, scripture, who God is, the nature of God. But this man makes a breakthrough that Jesus says, I've never seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. And I want us to be aware that as we minister to people, and you may have an understanding of them that they are, these are pagans. They know nothing about God. You might be surprised that when they encounter the living God, when they come into Jesus and when they begin to express faith, they leapfrog you into faith that you wouldn't. You know, the, the thing is that all of Israel, they had this filter and, and, and they, they lived with this filter that, that held them back from faith. This, this Roman centurion, he got it. He understood the, the, the nature of, of, of God, his, his authority. And so it is that, that we, who week after week sit in, in the pews, we develop this filter of what God can and cannot do, how he will and how he won't work. Um, we need to be willing to, in the moment, when we see great faith manifest in people's lives, to learn from them even as, Certainly, this, the centurion would have needed people to come alongside him and to pour into him maturity and, and understanding of, of Scripture, but, but it's, it's a mutual relationship. So I want to encourage us that to, as new believers come, don't be surprised that they, they, they jump us. They leapfrog us in faith. And we need to acknowledge that and encourage that because we want to join them in that great faith. Going on to the next verse 14 through 17. Jesus then who is in Capernaum, and it's, we, we know from Mark and Luke that this is on a Sabbath day. And it says, coming home from the synagogue, Matthew doesn't bring this, this out, Mark and Luke do. He comes home from the synagogue and, and, and when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw that his mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And he, he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now, it's interesting because it's, it's really after sundown in the evening. And so they've got a, somebody in the synagogue is saying, don't be healed on the Sabbath. Come after, you know, God does not heal on the Sabbath. Jesus would have healed, you know. He, he makes that, this, this comes up again and again, that this, this whole thing. But after sundown, it says all the sick and many who were oppressed by demons come. So they're, they're coming by, by dozens, probably over a hundred, and they're lined up to see Jesus. And for him, and he, the blind, the, the deaf, the lame, those with back issues and arthritis, depression, uh, bondage to sin, they're all coming. And, and Jesus is one by one by one is, is healing them. Whatever, that, whatever it is, that the, the affliction that they're... And they, they really don't have a lot in common. You know, there's... Not all the people that come are wor unworthy, you know. They're not worthy of being healed. 
Remember the Roman centurion? What he says, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy to come under, for you to come under my roof. So people are coming, and, and, and some of them are coming from very shady backgrounds. They're not coming because they're, they're, they're worthy of being healed. Not all of them are coming from a place of faith. They're coming from a place of need. They're hoping, but, but not great faith. They're, they're, they're hoping, but they're not certain that Jesus is going to be able to heal them or not. So they have this one common thread that they're all broken and they recognize it. And I want us to recognize that thread in ourselves and all, everyone around us. We're broken. We need Jesus to touch our lives in, in significant and special ways. We, we need to be healed. We, all of us stand in need of further healing. <laughs> That, that's a fact. And everyone around us uh, needs to be touched by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice that, again, that Jesus desired. He says, I will, I will, I will, I will. His heart was that they be healed. The Isaiah 53 is what Ma Matthew quotes where he, when he says that he took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. That's Isaiah 53, 4. Isaiah 53 uh, and verse 5, the very next verse is, by his stripes we are healed. By his wounds we, we're made, made whole. We're, we're, we're healed. And Isaiah 53 is just as valid today as it was 2,000 years ago. As we begin to, to bring this thought to a close, it's often taught um, that the miracles of Jesus were there to authenticate the message. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That the miracles of Jesus were there to authenticate that he's the Messiah, to, to authenticate, to show that, yes, this, this is the, the, the gospel of, of God that's being preached to you here. While that is, I think, generally true, I don't think it's the fullness my question that I want you to ponder today is what if the purpose of the healings and the deliverances wasn't just to authenticate Jesus and the gospel? What happened if it was the gospel? What happened if it was the gospel? The gospel is the good news that, that our Savior has come and that, that he has provided salvation for us. But salvation... Jesus does not make a distinction between the soul and the body. Have you noticed that? We do. We, 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 we make this distinction. We say that, well, God is more interested in saving my soul than he is my body. I, I challenge that, that you will not come to that conclusion by reading Scripture. In fact, what you'll find is that Jesus seems much more interested in the body than he does the spiritual life of people as he, as he ministers to them. And it's interesting to me. And, and I think so often that the greatest obstacle to Jesus' healing of our soul is actually showing that he's capable of healing the wounds that, that cover our soul, our body. You know, the body is the gateway to the heart of a, of a person. And so often Jesus would deal with those issues first, showing, showing that that God loves them in a way that allowed him them to speak to their heart and allow him to, to, to bring salvation to their lives as well. But I don't see that Jesus is ever making that, that distinction between the body and the soul. He, he desires to touch them in totality, body and soul. So as we close, I... Jesus is still, I want to make this declaration, he's, he's just still willing and he desires to do kingdom work in people's lives, which is to do the stuff. He, he, he wants to touch people in the place of their greatest pain, their greatest need. And I want us to be confident of that, and not just confident, but boldly confident in that. That leper, for that leper, that leprosy represented his greatest need. And Jesus met him in that need when he touched him and when he, he said, be clean. And by, when that leper was cleansed of that, the leprosy, his estrangement from God was cleansed as well. He knew beyond a shadow of doubt that there was a God who loved him. There was a God who cared for him. 
And there's this drawing into relationship with the Lord Jesus that, that comes about from that. So often the people around us, I want you to just begin to see them as broken, just like us. And they've got debris, and that debris guards their heart. That, that debris guards people's hearts spiritually. And sometimes you're going to have to move the debris to be able to get to their heart. It, it's kind of like show and tell. You've you got to show them the love of God before you can speak into their heart the reality of who Jesus is. And so it is that this debris can, comes in all forms. And as Janine was sharing, you know, I, I love that Jesus was interested in ministering to the people's physical needs, hunger. He gave them food, you know, clothing. I mean, he, he, he says, your heavenly father knows that you need these things. You know, there, there's this, but there's also other needs too. Needs of, of, of healing, needs of the body that need to be addressed, needs of the emotions that need to be healed. Minds that need to be to healed as well. The depression, the, you know, th all these things. Jesus, his heart is to, to, to heal them. So I want us to recognize the place of the greatest need and, and be willing to step in and boldly minister to that. To remove the debris so that you can minister Jesus at the deepest level to their heart. So ask this question. Who does Jesus desire to, you to touch today? Who is it that he wants you to be him to, you know, to be Jesus to them and, and to be willing to actually go into to, to, to the places that require supernatural healing? <laughs> you know, the things that you can't do, you can't make well, you can't make better, you can't fix, and to go there. We would rather stay in, in the places, in, in the, the shallow water, so to speak, and the things I can feed you. I'm willing to do, but am I willing to? I was praying. I was telling Dan this. Um, I, I didn't know if I'd share this, but I was on a walk and I was just flowing in the spirit, and I was praying in this nature a couple of weeks ago, and and I was just making these de declarations, you know, the heart of God. And I, and I was holding on my papa's hand, you know, father's hand. And uh, Jesus saw the eyes of the blind open. And Papa, I want to see them open too. And, and that was one, <laughs> one of the prayers I, I was praying. And a, lot of, a lot in that vein. And I came around the corner of my, my road, Scribner and Scribner Branch, where it intersects the dirt road. And I turn the corner, I look up, and there's my, my neighbor, uh, Brent Morrow. And, and Brent is, you know, his dad was... Um, a friend of my dad, the pastor, the same denomination, everything. And it, it's interesting that he lives just a couple of houses away, even though, um, yeah, the Lord has brought our lives near in some way. And, and so he's coming down to get his garbage can. And, and so I, I wave to him, and he's waiting for me to, 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 to come over. And so I, I walk over, and, and we begin to talk. And he says, well, I've been painting. And, but uh, he says, I have to... Um, the trim work, the, the, where it takes fine work. Um, he says, I have to follow the sun. And I said, oh. He says, yeah. He says, uh, since my eye injury, he says, I, I, can't, um, I can't see well enough to, um, to be able to, to make, to see the distinction between the colors. And uh, I need the full, the full brightness of the sun. So he says, I just, I just follow the sun and paint wherever the sun's shining. And and so he got his can, and he, we walked off, and I continued on my walk. And all of a sudden, you know, it occurred to me, I will see the eyes of the blind open. The Lord just chewed it up, right? <laughs> it wasn't a lack of faith. I, it, didn't even, it didn't even occur to me. I, it didn't, I, I'd so quickly lost the connection of what I just declared in the Spirit was just set up. It's that way. I, I, so often, we, I want us to begin to, not just intellectually like so often I do, but actually begin to see those opportunities queued up for us. That the Lord is wanting to do some amazing things through, through our lives. And I want to encourage you to, as I'm encouraging myself, is that I don't think the Lord 
is going to stop at that. Oh, you failed. You know. is it, I'm looking for more opportunities, more, <laughs> more T-balls, please. <laughs> I, so that's my prayer for us, is that our hearts would really, really just aligned with his and that we would just see opportunities around us, those that need to be touched in the name of Jesus. Can you do that? Yeah, I just encourage you. Let's pray. Father, I, again, I just want to thank you for Jesus and I thank you for the heart of Jesus. The way that he loved people the way that he extravagantly poured his life out upon people. I, I'm just in awe of the way he loved. And, and it's the way you love. It's, it's, it's your heart. It's, and I thank you that, that we're called to be in a heart relationship with you. That we're to share your heart with people around us. And I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that that would be a manifest reality in us. Lord, that it's just not enough for you to dwell in us, but that, you, that the goal is that you be poured out on all those that are around us in need. So I pray for eyes that see, that discern the needs, but then a heart, a boldness and courage that comes alongside and wants to express no matter what that is. Jesus, authentically Jesus to them. I thank you, Lord. And I just I pray that we would in boldness, go where Jesus and it requires commanding backs to be made well and commanding <laughs> blind eyes to open. I pray, Lord, that even that you'd give us the courage and the boldness in that moment to do that. So thank you, Jesus. We want to be authentically you to a world that needs to see you. Amen.